Lori, this is Mike Hickson with GBN. We're glad that you're a part of our program today. What happened to the people who died before Christ died? Did they go to hell without having their sins covered by the blood of Christ? Is it wrong to take communion more than gambling? once on the first day of the week? Why is it okay? Or can you is take it with your brothers and pattern? sisters during the morning service and also take it again? What is it ever right to use and make images of Christ on the bulletin during the first day of the church? How about a ceramic figure of Christ? Welcome to GBN Live. I'm B.J. Clark, and we're glad that you've joined us for the program tonight. And here with us tonight on the panel, we're glad to welcome Brother Paul Sane, who's an evangelist at the East Hill Church of Christ in Pulaski, Tennessee. Brother Sane, it's always good to have you with us. It's wonderful to be a part of this great work. Yes, sir. And uh, Brother Don Blackwell, the executive director of the Gospel Broadcasting Network and a very much appreciated gospel preacher as well, and he's been an elder in the Lord's Church also in his time as a gospel preacher and Christian. Uh, Brother Don, it's always good to work with you. Thank you. Always good to be here. Yes, sir. Uh, we're studying a very vital subject tonight, and that is one that is somewhat controversial. In fact, more than somewhat, it is. Uh, it's marriage and divorce and remarriage. And I want to begin tonight by setting this uh, on the table just to make sure we're all on the same page. Who gets to decide what the rules are for marriage, divorce, and remarriage, and why does he get to decide this? And I want to begin with you, Brother Sane, tonight as we begin. If someone were to ask you, well, who made you God, or why do you have the right to tell me what to do, it's who I can marry, who I can't marry, who I can divorce, when I can divorce, what would you say to them in response to that question? Who gets to decide this subject? It's the foundation of everything that we're talking about. We were created by God, placed here on earth by God, instructed by our Father, Jehovah God, and told of a home after this earthly sojourn that is ours if we adjust our lives and live according to the parameters. There are things that we cannot do. There are things that we must do. Mm -hmm. And thus God, having spoken to us, He has already established what is right, what is wrong, what must be done. And we must in this holy word abide by that, which includes marriage, divorce, and remarriage. God established marriage in the very beginning. In Genesis chapter 1 and 2 and 3, we read about that creation, that first home. And God put the parameters of that and what is an acceptable marriage mm -hmm. from the very beginning. So you're saying it's God's invention. And so since marriage is authored by God, Brother Blackwell, doesn't that mean he has the right to legislate what constitutes a scriptural marriage and what constitutes scriptural divorce and remarriage? Absolutely he does, and, and I'm glad you started off this way because uh, this is a very emotionally packed question for people. And it's a question that when you talk about this, oftentimes people will say, this doesn't seem right to me. It doesn't feel right to me. But in Matthew 19, when Jesus was asked the question, can a man put away his wife for every cause? Jesus did not say, well, it, it seems to me, or he did not say, well, well, it feels. He asked him, have you not read? He went back to the beginning and said, to answer this question, we have to go to the source of authority. God is the designer of marriage. And so we can't let our emotions cloud this issue. We have to go back and see what does God say about this. And you know, so, we often think about what's fair, mm -hmm. what's not right, what's <laughs> fair to us. But it's through our eyes. And Isaiah 55 tells us we can't put our minds around God and His thoughts and what He has declared as being best for us. Right. We didn't invent marriage. It's not our uh, organization, our institution. And so since God is the author of it, He has the right to discuss what is uh, right and wrong. And others who may debate it for hours really are always going to end up having to admit, no, it's not my institution. And so God is the one who ultimately decides it. And I want to let everyone know that's watching tonight, we're not a governing body of the Churches of Christ on this program. We're three gospel preachers who are interested in finding out what God's Word says about this subject or any subject. 
And for those who might want to call in and ask a question or make a comment, please understand that we're going to be going to this book right here and giving you a thus saith the Lord. We won't be telling you what our opinion is about this, that, or the other because on the day of judgment that would be worthless and we have no authority to speak on our own opinion on this matter anyway because marriage isn't ours. It belongs to God. The marriage bed is undefiled, but it's His. He is the one who authored it and instituted it, and we need to keep that in mind. Well, let's talk about this uh, subject of marriage and divorce and remarriage. Brother Don, when it comes to divorce, it's obviously not something any of us want to ever have to experience. Did Jesus ever give a scriptural reason that one could end the marriage of, uh, that they're involved in? Yes. Um, in fact, uh, Matthew, Ma Matthew chapter 19 is the text that we always go to. I think it's one of the most uh, straightforward and clear text in the Bible. It's interesting in Matthew 19 when the Jews came trying to trap Jesus and they right. asked Him, can a man divorce his wife for any reason? Jesus' initial answer was uh, no. That, that God joined a man and a woman together. But then he goes on, he said that he says originally that was not God's intent. God's intent was for a man and a woman to remain married. Then he does go on and he gives one exception to the rule. The rule is stay married. Mm -hmm. The one exception to the rule he gives in Matthew chapter 19 verse 9 and that is for fornication. If fornication has occurred, a man can put his wife away. If she has uh, cheated on him, she has committed fornication, the innocent can put the guilty party away for that reason, fornication. In fact, that is the only exception that is given in the Bible. Uh, a lot of times people want to bring up uh, lots of other difficult situations. Right. And certainly your heart uh, goes out to people who are in these difficult situations. Sure. But the only passage that the Lord gave, the only exception the Lord gave, is Matthew chapter 19 and verse 9. I want to read it as we begin because I know we're going to refer back to this Absolutely. many times. Yes. Jesus said, And I say unto you, Whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whoever and whoso marrieth her which is put away doth commit adultery. Mm -hmm. And so he said, if a man divorces his wife and marries another, and the reason is not fornication, then he is living in a state of adultery in that second marriage. Right. And the first phrase, and I say unto you, is significant because if the words of Christ are going to judge us in the last day, and John 12, 48 says that they will, then the fact that he says this is not like what the latest Gallup poll says or what uh, some preacher said. It's what Jesus came right out and said. I'm glad you mentioned something about uh, the general rule because it reminds me when I was at uh, Fried Hardeman going to school there, they had a sign above the gymnasium door. On one entrance it said, no food and drink in the gymnasium. And then at the other door it said, no food and drink in the gymnasium. And then next to it was an exception, except during ball games. And I thought about Luke 16, 18, which gives the general rule that uh, whosoever putteth away his wife and marrieth another committeth adultery. It doesn't give an exception in that passage because the general rule is that God doesn't want that done. But Matthew 19 does give the exception. And uh, Brother Saint, what if somebody comes up to you and says, but it's so complicated. It's just so hard to figure out. There's so many different views on it. And uh, one eldership I heard about in Indiana came back from a conference and they announced to the congregation, they said, we've just come back from a conference. There are eight different positions on this subject in the brotherhood. And we've decided we don't have a position on this subject as an eldership because it's just too murky for any of us to figure out. What would you say to those folks? Well, there must be a decisive fact that we can hold on to. And Matthew 19 is that area. Matthew 5 also, 1 Corinthians 7, Romans 7. All of these, the composite of which tell us what God desires and what God has legislated, if we want to use that term. We haven't mentioned Malachi 2.16 yet, which also emphasizes that God does not want divorce. He hates divorce. Mm -hmm. So it's God's desire that there be one man, one woman, and that is that which constitutes a marriage according to the Bible. And they are to stay married until... But somebody says, well, it's too complicated. Just recently I had a conversation with a good friend. And his position is, is that Christ's blood, the cleansing power of Christ's blood is unlimited. 
and thus it can wash away. And we can touch that blood either in baptism or in repentance and that that will wash away any sins. So again, he's cloudying the waters, mm -hmm. but that's not what God said. Right. God said, except it be for that one circumstance, mm -hmm. period, right. no other choice. We can understand that. Right. It's that we do not choose to understand that. That eldership can understand that. Mm -hmm. If I were to just guess, and that's nothing more than what I'm doing, it would likely be my supposition that that eldership may have some families there that are already involved in a difficult situation that they would have to uh, take a hold of if they took a stand. Right. But the fact is, God has spoken and we can understand it. Uh, you know, we've started the program tonight by showing first the authority for marriage comes from God Himself who authored it. He has the right to make the rules. We've talked about the passage that shows the simplicity of this and uh, Brother Guy in Woods was well known and loved and respected and one of the last sermons he ever preached I was privileged to hear in which he said sometimes people will come up to me and say Brother Woods after all your decades of Bible study what is your analysis of Matthew 19.9 and he said I tell them that Matthew 19.9 after many years of study I've come to the conclusion it means this Whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whoso marrieth her that is put away doth commit adultery. They seemed to be dissatisfied with his answer, and so they said, no, we're, we're wanting you to exegete it. Give us, draw out the meaning of the text. What's your expert analysis? He said, all right, here it is. Whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whoso marrieth her that is put away doth commit adultery. And then he said this, I'll never forget it. He said, the passage doesn't need explaining as much as it needs believing. And Brother Blackwell, we started with the truth about this subject, but as you well know, Satan is always lurking to take the truth God has given and to modify it, just like he did in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve and saying that word not, uh, you shall not surely die. So how is Satan, what are some of the methods that uh, Satan has used to try to muddy the waters on this subject right here? One of the probably most common errors um, that people have embraced is the idea that uh, baptism washes away all sins and so if you, are in an, if you are in an unscriptural marriage and then you become a Christian, that baptism sanctifies that, it washes away that sin and now you're, you are in a marriage that is acceptable to God. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, from the emotional side, you can understand why people uh, reach this conclusion. Um, if you find yourself in an unscriptural marriage, the implications of getting out of it are significant. They're huge. They're going to impact uh, your life and your family, and it is going to require a significant, uh, a monumental change in your life, a sacrifice. And so I can see a person reading Matthew 19, and saying, it, surely it can't mean that. They're, they're grasping, wanting it to mean something else. Right. And so when someone comes along and offers another explanation, you can see why someone would grasp onto that. Now, there are lots of different uh, explanations or errors that people have put out there to get around this. That is one of probably the most common ones I ever hear, and that is baptism washes away unscriptural marriages. And so if I entered into this marriage before I became a Christian. When I became a Christian, I was forgiven of that and I can remain in this marriage. And the response to that is, what's the best response one could give to that? The response that I would simply give is, it is true that baptism can wash away uh, any sin, but any sin that's going to be forgiven must be repented of. Right. And so if a person says, I want to obey the gospel, I want to become a Christian, well, when we cite the steps of the plan of salvation, we say he must hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. Right. And so if he's living in a sinful situation, baptism can forgive that mm -hmm. if he will repent. Now, repentance demands stopping that. Uh, we just read in Matthew 19, a man enters into a second marriage that's unscriptural. He is committing adultery. He's living in a constant sin, right. uh, a constant process of sinning. Mm -hmm. And so if a man were a thief and he said, well, I was... Um, baptized and so I was forgiven of that and I'm going to continue to steal. Everyone would say that's, that's not correct. If a man's a homosexual and he's engaging in homosexuality 
And uh, he said, well, I'm a Christian now. I'm, I'm forgiven. I'm going to continue uh, being a homosexual. We understand that doesn't work. Right. And this is in the same category. A person who's in an unscriptural marriage is living in a sin. If they don't stop, it indicates they never repented in the first place. Mm -hmm. As they remain in it, they're continuing that sin. And so the only way they can be forgiven is they've got to stop that and then repent of it, and the Lord will forgive them of that. Yes, sir. This is a live call-in program, and uh, you might be watching for the first time and not be aware of that. So let me tell you that if you'd like to call the program, the number is 662-874-5508, 662-874-5508. And we do have a caller on the line. Uh, Brother Pat McIntosh is the assistant director with the Bear Valley Bible Institute in Denver in their extensions program and he's done a lot of mission work in UK, uh, Ukraine, excuse me, in Nigeria and he teaches a couple of classes in the graduate program at Bear Valley, a graduate of the Brown Trail School of Preaching in 1989 and also has an MDiv from Amridge University. Uh, Brother uh, McIntosh, are you on the line with us? Yes, I am, DJ. So good to have you tonight. Uh, I know as a gospel preacher you've had to deal with this subject in local work, I know you've had to deal with it in the classroom as you've taught in schools of preaching. Uh, if you will, give us some of the clearest and best insights that you think we have to keep in mind as we address this emotionally volatile issue. Well, it, it is an emotional issue. It is a highly volatile issue. Uh, but as has been indicated, it's an issue that is very easily cleared up uh, through the Scriptures if we we'll just approach the Scriptures in a proper fashion. Uh, teaching at, at Brown Trail now. I'm teaching 1 Corinthians this quarter. Mm -hmm. And we're going to be dealing for about three days with the uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 7 because of the issues and because of the uh, nature uh, of the culture in the church today uh, regarding these things. Brother McIntosh, perhaps our viewers may not be aware of the argument that some make from 1 Corinthians 7. We began tonight by noticing Matthew 19, 9 says there's one exception, and that is fornication. But some have suggested that no, desertion would also be a legitimate reason for divorcing your mate and remarrying. Uh, based on uh, their understanding of 1 Corinthians 7 and verse 15, which says, uh, brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases. Uh, what would uh, you help them understand about the meaning of that text and why it doesn't mean what they claim it means? Well, it, it cannot mean what they claim it means because you would have a direct contradiction in Scripture and that would negate uh, inspiration. Right. If there is a single contradiction in Scripture, then inspiration did not occur. Christ very clearly indicated that there was only one exception, and that was fornication. When you look at the concept with, that Paul was dealing with, uh, if if I'm, say for example, I'm married and my wife chooses to, to leave and she gives me an ultimatum, it's, it's me or the church, uh, then I'm to let her go in that situation. If she's going to depart, that's the case, because I have never been so bound to that marriage to lose my faith over it or to violate a very clear scripture mm -hmm. in that regard. So my understanding of that passage is that I am not so bound to the marriage uh, so as to sacrifice my faith. Okay. Brother Blackwell, as we keep Brother McIntosh on the line and discuss this with Brother Sane and Brother Blackwell, as some have argued, well, it says bondage there in 1 Corinthians 7 and verse 15. We're not under bondage, and so uh, they argue it must be the marriage bond. Is there any evidence to the contrary that our viewers need to consider? You know, there's several things I think we can bring out here. Number one, this, the basis of this argument is if a person's spouse abandons them, then they're not under bondage. That means they are free to remarry. Is that a proper interpretation? If you look just a few verses prior to this in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 7, he describes a situation like this. Listen to what he says in verse 10. Now to the married I command, yet not I but the Lord, a wife is not to depart from her husband. She is not to abandon her husband. but even if she does depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. And then he says, and a husband is not to divorce his wife. And so he describes a situation where a spouse abandons you. Mm -hmm. What do you do with that? He says, she cannot remarry and he is not to divorce his wife. And so the idea that not under bondage means that uh, you're no longer bound, you can 
uh, remarry. He's already said that's not what it means in, right. in the prior verses. Um, also, when you look at this and you discuss um, what, do, what does it mean that uh, you're not under bondage, this is an interesting reading. This is another version, but listen how this, this is how the ESV reads. But if the unbelieving partner separates, let it be so. In such cases, the brother or sister is not enslaved. God has called you to peace. What it means is if, you are the unbe if your unbelieving spouse says to you, you quit this Christianity stuff or I'm leaving, right. you're not a slave to them. You are not uh, obligated to do what they said in order to maintain your marriage. Mm -hmm. You be faithful to Christ. This word bondage is never used with reference to the marriage bond. Right. And so if this is the case in 1 Corinthians 7, it's an exception to the rule. Right. We've got 133 cases of the word dulu being used uh, for slave or servant or bondage. Never once it refers to the marriage bond unless this, this is the exception. Brother McIntosh, you teach 1 Corinthians. Uh, is there a word for the marriage bond in the immediate vicinity of this text that shows that Paul knew that word existed and could have used it in verse 15 if he'd wanted to? Uh, I, I think that's exactly the case. Uh, I, I, I don't have my, my language in front right. of me at this time. Uh, yeah. But it, it, it's clearly a case, uh, as I indicated earlier, that to, to take one position would put another uh, in clear contradiction with one another. Right. And uh, Paul and, and, and Jesus, in fact, didn't Paul say, Brother McIntosh, the things that he wrote were the commandments of the Lord, 1 Corinthians exactly, 14, 37? Exactly. And what Paul was doing there was he was indicating there were things that Christ dealt with mm -hmm. and things that he has dealt with. There were several different scenarios under consideration. Right. Uh, and what Paul was addressing was something that Christ did not specifically address. Well, the same, uh, uh, and, and, and he's not giving his opinion in that regard. Right, right. Brother Sain's also with us, and I want him to interact with you too, Brother McIntosh. Um, okay. Brother Sain, uh, we talked about this. It doesn't mean you're enslaved. The Bible do, does use the terminology of us being servants or slaves of Christ. So is the passage saying we're not in, so enslaved to our mate in, that we would ever be required to give up our service to Christ in order to serve our mates? Uh, whims and wishes rather than Christ's whims and wishes? Certainly so. Not only our spouse, but anyone else for that matter. Right. Anything that would come between us and serving God, being acceptable in the sight of God, must be rejected. Matthew 10, 28 speaks about we should not fear even those that can ultimately kill us, mm -hmm. but fear those that can destroy us spiritually, our soul. And the same would be applied here as far as 1 Corinthians 7. If indeed those horrendous circumstances prevailed and the spouse says, I'm leaving, either you give it up or I'm, I'm gone, then we've got to grieve, mm -hmm. be sorrowful, wishing that that was not the case. Even Paul would elsewhere refer to the fact of the reconciliation that hopefully would result after being apart from each other. But to come back together, uh, that would be God's desire. But still, our allegiance must be first and foremost to our Savior. Right. Yeah. Brother McIntosh, I remember studying, and correct me if I'm wrong about this, that the tense of the verb that's used here is one which most literally could be translated, you have not been in bondage like this in the past. You are not now in such bondage, and the idea is you never would be in such bondage. Well, that, doesn't that prove this can't be a reference to the marriage bond? Exactly. We, 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 have, we are never and have never been uh, so bound to a human relationship right. that, we, that we find ourselves in contradiction with God's will. God, God is, is, is the standard. Uh, that, that relationship is supreme. Mm -hmm. And the others uh, are, are, are feeders off that, if you will. Yes, sir. Uh, the tense of that, I, I remember studying the same thing. If this terminology did refer to the marriage bond, it would be saying, you are not now, nor have you ever been bound to your spouse. And it cannot mean that. Right. I think everyone accepts that. Right. And uh, I was thinking earlier about that use that Paul has of a little word called deo in Greek for the marriage bond, and he uses that in the very vicinity here in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 27, are you bound unto a wife? 
He says, well, seek not to be loosed. Are you loosed from a wife? Seek not a wife. The word he used for bound here is different than the word he used for bondage in verse 15. It's obvious he's using one in reference to the marriage bond and the other in reference to you're not enslaved to your mate to the point of giving up Christ in order to keep your mate with you. But B.J., you know, you was talking originally about how Satan tries to wield such a powerful influence <clears throat> upon us and to get us somewhat away from the plan that God established in the very beginning. And that's exactly what this is. You look at 1 Corinthians 7, we can understand what it's saying. It will take just it factually without being skewed, without a desire to find a loophole, without a desire to try to say, okay, my child is in that, my spouse, you know, my friend is in that, right. and I'm trying to find a way that it's okay for them to be married to the one that they're married to or divorced from whom they wish to be. If you take away all of those influencing factors, yes. we can understand if it. If you just let it speak, right? Exactly. And Brother McIntosh, do you have any final comments you'd like to give us? No, I, w I want to thank you for dealing with this. I, I, I would uh, mention one thing, and then I'd be interested. I, I'll, I'll uh, hang up and listen to your comments. For me, the true test of applying the truths on marriage, divorce, and remarriage are when family are involved. We know various uh, preachers who once held a sound position uh, on this doctrine right. no longer do. And as is often the case, when one of their daughters or one of their children got involved, then they've had to adjust their position to maintain some sense of peace and harmony mm -hmm. in, in the family. Appreciate y'all dealing with this and, and, and appreciate y'all hearing me out. Well, we appreciate you teaching on this subject as a gospel preacher for all these many years. Uh, Brother Blackwell, he referred to something that reminds me of a passage back in Deuteronomy 13 where he says, if your brother, I mean the very son of your mother comes to you and tries to get you to go serve idol gods or if your own wife tries to get you to do that or uh, someone that's your best friend tries to get you to do that, you don't do it and you actually have the courage to turn them in for trying to get you to do it. Uh, doesn't that teach us the principle that when it comes to God's truth, it has to reign supreme over family considerations. Yes, absolutely. And uh, the idea behind this, I think, is uh, God's law on marriage is strict. It is very strict. And sometimes when it hits a person's own family, they will say, it can't really mean that. It, th that is too strict. When people have that thinking, I think it's good for them to go back and look at the reaction of the Lord's disciples. In Matthew 19, when Jesus laid out the teaching on marriage divorce, His disciples said in verse 10, if the case of the man be so with his wife, it is good not to marry. Their reaction was, Lord, this is very strict. In fact, they said, this is so strict, maybe it would be better not to get married in the first place if, if it is this strict. Well, what's the point? The point is when they heard it, they interpreted, Lord, this is a very strict a law that you have laid down. And we have to understand that is the case. When a person enters into marriage, he is entering into something that is very serious. The, the uh, implications of this are for the rest of his life. And then when he makes mistakes, he has entered into a situation that he has complicated it. And he right. has, if we would do it the way the Lord said in the first place, it would all be all right. But when we sin and we complicate it, that's when the strictness and the difficulties and the consequences come along. Right. B.J., recently, well, I say recently, not too long ago, we had two different families where I preach in Tennessee mm -hmm. that came to the decision, independent of each other, other not knowing of the other studies. And both of those couples came to the conclusion that they were in adultery. And they said, and one of them said, especially one couple in my office with tears flowing down their face, sure. with hearts that was broken, Two small children were involved. But they said, we want to go to heaven more than we want a marriage that's not pleasing to God. And is it not the case that when we look at this subject, such a hot button issue, that if we reach down to the depths of our soul to look at, God, what do you want? Right. I will do it. I will conform my life to it. I will adhere to it. I love you. I want to go to heaven more than anything else. This couple ended up separating. They felt like they had to. Right. Hard decision? Oh, certainly. Break our heart with those children? Yes. Saw them just recently, loved and hugged on them. 
but their mom and dad set a, an, an example of this is supreme, mm -hmm. and my God is going to rule my life. I can't help but believe that that is more important than even that family, the four of them living together. Yeah. Absolutely. It reminds me of the statement you were referring to where the apostles, the disciples said, well, that's so strict. Jesus went on to say, well, some are made eunuchs by men, but some make themselves that way for the kingdom of heaven's sake. True. And you're describing such a, True. a couple that said, basically, we will do... Uh, without the privileges of marriage and its relationship physically in order to please God and to be able to go True. to heaven someday. And that's marvelous. Uh, this is a live call-in program, 874-5508. The prefix would be 662-874-5508. We'd love to have you call in if you've got a call. And we do have another caller at this time, uh, Brother Wesley Simons, who's the a preacher and elder at the Stony Creek Church of Christ and also directs the Tri-City School of Preaching and Christian Development and was the producer of the Arise to Truth uh, radio program that I listened to for so many years when I was first cutting my eye teeth as a gospel preacher. Uh, Brother Simons, it's good to have you on the broadcast. Thank you. It's good to be on. And Brother Simons, uh, some folks say that, look, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John do not apply to us because, well, that was all before the cross of Jesus Christ and we're under the Testament, the New Testament, and that didn't come into force until after Christ died. But he said what he said about marriage while he was still alive, Matthew 19, 9. And so how do you help someone who makes the argument that says uh, Christians aren't even under the law of Christ when it comes to marriage, divorce, and remarriage? Okay, B.J., there's a argument, one argument, that says that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were part of the Old Testament. Well, if that's true, you think about what a ridiculous position that puts God in. Because Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John would have been written somewhere around 50 to about 55 A.D. So after Jesus Christ died and nailed the the old law to the cross, Colossians 2, 14 through 16, mm -hmm. he decided, oh, by the way, I need to add four more books to that. <laughs> and so now we got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Well, we know that Matthew 19, 9 did not apply to the Mosaical teachings. Why? Because if one was caught committing adultery, they were to be stoned to death. Mm -hmm. And so we know it wasn't part of the Old Testament. Not only that, when you think about, what about Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? To what age do they apply? Well, in Matthew chapter 18, if you got out with your brother, go to him privately. If that doesn't work, take two or three witnesses. If that doesn't work, tell it to the church. Right. So there's something that applies to the Christian age. Mm -hmm. Not only that, you got uh, John 3, 3 through 5, being born again. Now, uh, when, when does that apply? Mm -hmm. I told Brother Billingsley this. And Brother Billingsley said, well, that's a prophecy of the new age. I said, well, let's just look at Matthew 19, 9. Then as a prophecy of the new age. <laughs> right. So, B.J., it won't work to try to get right. rid of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And for our viewers who may not uh, be aware of it, there is a brother by the name of Dan Billingsley who started taking this erroneous position and advocating it and promoting it and he's had several debates and brother Simons has been among those to uh, show the truth on this subject. Um, what if they say well though the, the books were written after uh, the death of Christ on the cross and his resurrection the establishment of the church uh, Jesus said the words while he was still under the Old Testament, and so what if they try to make the argument, well, uh, therefore, because he said it before the New Testament came into being, doesn't matter when Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John wrote it, he still said it under the Old Testament. Then what would you say? Well, a lot of things that Jesus said under while he was living under Old Testament law, we don't deny that, mm -hmm. that he did live under Old Testament law, Galatians 4.4. While it's true, he said some things, those teachings, many of which apply to the New Testament age, such as I 
used a moment ago, Matthew chapter 18. Right, right. And uh, John 3, 3 through 5. What are we going to do with Mark 16, 15 and 16? What are we going to do with Matthew 28, 18 through the rest of the chapter? Right. See, all of that applies to the Christian age. Yes, sir. And so there's such a thing as anticipatory legislation that, that the Lord is giving, right? That's right. Yes, sir. Uh, so, well, Brother Simons, if you'll stay on the line with us, I want our panelists, uh, Brother Blackwell and Brother Sane, to have a chance to also speak and talk with you. Uh, Brother Don, as you think about uh, this idea that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are not a part of the New Testament, uh, it's amazing that that doctrine still persists when the Bible's so clear on it. Why do you think that uh, people have such a hard time seeing the plain truth on this subject? I think it's because people are desperately looking for some way around this. And when they hear it, um, maybe it's perhaps one of the less common uh, of these things, and they hear it and they think, yes, there, there's one that um, I can take hold of. Um, you know, you were talking about uh, the Lord laying these things down in um, anticipation, mm -hmm. uh, preparation for the law that would go into effect. You know, it's not hard to understand every law is laid out in advance and it has a date on which it's going to go into effect. That right. takes place in our country. Uh, we are told, you know, the Congress typically will vote on something and they'll say at the first of this next year it will go into effect. This is not something that's foreign to us. This is, this is the natural process of laws. And as um, I was going to bring up, Brother Simons beat me to it, the Great Commission is part of the Gospels. If the Gospels are part of the Old Testament, then the command to carry the New Testament law into all of the world is not applicable. Mm -hmm. And that makes no sense whatsoever. Brother Saint, I know you have a tender heart, and I love, that's one of the things I love about you. Uh, so I know that you can relate to what I'm about to say. And Brother Simons, I know you've dealt with this in your local work as a preacher, as an elder, perhaps. Um, and that is uh, some people that you just grow so fond of, and then you find out they're in this situation. I remember a couple in particular that they were on fire. She had quit her job at the fitness a place because she said, I'm not going to wear the things they want me to wear there because I think they're too uh, provocative and immodest. And so she was making great strides. One Sunday, I just mentioned Matthew 19.9, quoted it in passing, didn't stop to comment on it, just quoted it. And he came to me afterwards and he said, if what you said today in your sermon is true, then I think I might be living in adultery. And I said, well, let's hope that's not the case, but I'll come to your house this afternoon. And I did. And when I talked to them and discovered they were in this situation, I went home and I told my wife, I said, this must be where it starts for some preachers because emotionally, as much as I love this couple, I wanted to honestly find a way to make it okay for them, but there was no way I could change the Word of God, presume to do that. How do you handle it when people start saying, well, you, the Lord would never expect a couple to break up and to uh, break up a family when children are involved. I want to hear from you, Brother Sane, and then from Brother Simons, our caller. What would you say? There's many thoughts that come flooding to my mind. Uh, the Lord has told us initially that being a child of His, being a follower of His, is going to be difficult. It's, going to be, it's that straight and narrow. In other words, if we do not love our parents less than Him, mm -hmm. we cannot be His disciple. Unless we love our children less than Him, we cannot. Unless we're willing to deny ourselves, take up the cross, and follow Him. So our Lord has very clearly defined what is required of us in order to be a, a Christian, walking the heavenly journey here uh, toward heaven on earth in this earthly journey, and to get there. When we come to that particular place, though, when a couple comes and maybe ultimately realizes, come to that realization, all we can do is try to empathetically sympathize, hurt with them, mm -hmm. but encourage them to make the right decisions that way that is right that cannot be wrong mm -hmm. and can guarantee that heaven's going to be their home. One of the co two couples I referred to a few moments ago, there was a little bit question in their mind as to whether or not it was adulterous or, or not. Right. But the man himself took the initiative and said, I want to make sure she gets to heaven. I want to get to heaven myself, right. and I must make that decision. We, that's all we can do is plead yes, that they will love the Lord mm -hmm. so much that they will be willing to do that. 
I had an elder some years ago. His wife had passed away. He had become acquainted with uh, another lady there in the church. The lady had explicitly told me and many others multiple times, in fact, I have no right to ever marry. I was married previously. I did not divorce him for the right reason. Right. And uh, yet with a changing of time, this elder looked at the scripture, analyzed, tried to come to the realization he uh, adopted the position of all men are not amenable to the gospel of Christ, the law of Christ. And thus, she during that particular time was not amenable to the law, thus it did not apply to her. And thus, in other words, that was his loophole. Mm -hmm. I tried to plead with him. I tried to implore him to love the Lord enough to accept the parameters that he has established. Right. And unless they do, then they're not going to please the Father. That's very good, and I appreciate your comments. So, Brother Simons, uh, are there any passages in the Bible that would show us uh, people that were unscripturally married and they broke off those marriages even though children were involved? Anything that our, our viewers could consider? Well, in the book of Ezra, after God told the children of Israel they could not marry the people in the land, mm -hmm. well, some of them did. And they were told by inspiration to put those wives away. So we know that God will endorse that. But in the case of Herod, married to Herodias, John the Baptist lost his head over this subject right. by telling Herod, you've, un you've unlawfully got your brother Philip's wife. Now, I want the uh, viewing audience to realize that one can have another person's wife. The Bible says so. Right. Now, since we're talking about lawful and unlawful, B.J., I would like to give four true or false questions that every gospel preacher, every elder needs to memorize. Yes, sir. And I use these in marriage counseling, and I let people counsel themselves by use, answering these questions. Right. Number one, true or false, only God can join two people together lawfully. That's true. Yes, sir. Number two, God always joins two people together in harmony with his marriage laws. That's true. Number three, only God can disjoin two people lawfully. That's true. Number four, God always disjoins two people in harmony with his divorce law. Great. Now, once we get people to see that, B.J., yes, sir. and then they say, well, I left this person over here because I couldn't get along with him, then I said, well, let's go back to the question that you answered. You said that only God could disjoin two people lawfully. Right. And then you agreed that he always disjoins two people in harmony with his divorce law. Yes, sir. Now, did he disjoin you and your mate? That's what I need to know. And boy, you're talking about powerful eyes start to open. Well, and you're letting the Bible speak for itself, too, and you're not having to make any decisions. You're letting God's Word do that, which is great. And we, we appreciate your call. We have another caller on the line, but we do appreciate your call, Brother Simons. Thank you for these excellent insights. Okay. Thank you, B.J., yes. for having me. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, uh, we have another caller. Linda Hurst is on the line with us. Linda, welcome to the program. Are you there? Linda, are you there? Well, while we're waiting on Linda, let's yes, go ahead. I'm here. Okay, hello, hello. Welcome to GBN Hi. Live. Glad you're here. Thank you. What's Thank on, you. What's on your mind Join tonight? Your, I have two questions. Okay. Um, one is if a couple, Christians, either way, get divorced because of fornication, and, and then, um, uh, after they get divorced, they decide that they really loved each other and maybe they should have forgiven whichever one it was. Mm -hmm. Is it biblically okay for them to remarry? Okay. Let me take that question to Brother Blackwell here and let him address that from a biblical standpoint. Okay. The way I understand the question is you have a man and a woman who were married. They decided to divorce and then they want to remarry each other. Is that the correct uh, question? That's correct. Okay. Um, of course, it was mentioned earlier, Malachi 2.16, God hates divorce. God's ideal situation is for a marriage to remain intact. 
Now the question is, once they're divorced, can they remarry each other? I would say that would be ideal. That would be uh, what God would desire. Now listen to this. I'm going to go back to Matthew 19. And I say unto you, Whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, commits adultery. Now the phrase another is key there. He is saying that a man has divorced his wife and he marries some other person. He enters into a situation that's not scriptural. That's not what you have if a person comes back and reunites with their original spouse. And I, In fact, I think what you have is what is ideal and what God is, would desire, and that is you have put that home back together. Excellent. Did you have another question? Yes, what's your other? You have another question? Uh, yes. Uh, if a couple that's Christians realize that if they become a Christian, they are not to be married because they've been married before. Mm -hmm. But one of them's health is really bad, and they know they can't live together as husband and wife, but the one spouse needs to take care of the other. And they decide to live in the same home separately mm -hmm. so that they can take care of this person. As of now, the one person died. Can they stay there? together like that, but not live as husband and wife. Okay. Brother Sain. It, 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 this type of question indicates the ramifications and all of the different avenues of thought. My reaction would be, be that certainly we can care for one another. We are to provide for one another, help one another, edify one another, love one another, all of the one another passages. And as long as they're not living together as husband and wife, as long as their reputation, per se, is not being influenced or detrimental from the standpoint of what God would have us as children of God to be, certainly in that condition health-wise to take care of one another, I see nothing wrong with that at all. We're not talking about marriage. We're not talking about sexually being involved, but rather just helping one another in that, in that declined condition. All right. Uh, okay. that answer your questions? I know a, a couple that's not Christians, and she knows what to do to become a Christian, okay. but she won't because she, her husband is aged, and she knows she needs to be there for him, so she won't. They go to a Baptist church, but she won't become a Christian because she needs to be there with him and do everything for him. So that's, that's the other side of the coin, too. Okay. So. Well, we certainly appreciate the idea but, that someone would want to... Uh, take care of uh, someone who's ailing and uh, the ideal situation I suppose would be for them to find a way to do it without their reputation being questioned as far as uh, you know the situation that's what brother Sane was referring to a moment ago uh, but there's nothing that says someone can't show benevolence to another human being brother Blackwell you have any thoughts on this you know thinking about what she's saying there you've got um, if I understand the situation right you've got two people who the law says they're married, mm -hmm. but they're not really married. They're not scripturally married. Right. And they're wanting to remain in that situation because they, there's uh, care that needs to be given one to another. Bro Brother Simon said something when he was on the phone a moment ago that I think was key. And that is God is the one who ju does the joining in a marriage relationship. Okay. Matthew 19, 6, what God has joined together, let not man put asunder. If God hasn't joined you together, you're really not married. Right. And so this couple, though they, the law of the land says they're married, in the eyes of God, they are not married. Right. And so if they're thinking we're going to remain in this relationship because of health reasons, they need to understand they're really not in that relationship. They're really not married mm -hmm. in the eyes of God. It's just something that's, um, in a sense, a farce that the people in the world recognize. And if you've got Christians who are in that situation and they want to remain in it for that reason, and they may, might even make excuses and say, well, we won't be together sexually as a husband and a wife. They need to understand uh, they are damaging their reputation right. in that sense. And they cannot continue in that because God has not joined them. You know, I think it's um, interesting in Matthew 19, the same chapter that discusses marriage and divorce, right uh, shortly after that, he discusses the rich young ruler. Mm -hmm. And of course, what was required of the rich young ruler was to go and sell all that he had and to give to the poor and follow the Lord. The rich young ruler thought that this was a requirement that was just too heavy. Right. I don't think this is coincidental that these two things occur so close to each other. 
because though it is a, a different commandment, a different thing that's being considered, the implications of this are the same. Right, and it wouldn't preclude someone uh, providing for someone's medical care, but you don't have to live in the same house to do that, to get a hospice nurse or someone to come in and provide help and assistance. And so uh, the ideal situation would be to look for a place uh, where you could reside and still show, uh, you know, care as a human being, but not be questioned as far as whether you really are still living together as husband and wife or not. But that would be the ideal. All right, we have another caller. Joe, welcome to the program. Hello, Joe, are you there? Yes, I am. Welcome to the broadcast tonight. Thank you. I well, appreciate the um, subject matter. I just had a, uh, a question that perhaps you can answer. Yes, I would sir. just like to know um, how does the laws of Christ uh, regarding marriage, divorce, and remarriage, how does that affect those who are sinners and who may not be aware of those laws prior to becoming, uh, prior to uh, marriage and even prior to becoming a member of the church? Mm -hmm. uh, do you understand my question? I think so. I think I do. And uh, you're asking if I understand correctly what about someone who's uh, already involved in a situation and they, don't, they haven't heard the gospel yet so they don't know they're in a bad situation? How would they know okay. uh, that they were in a bad situation All right. uh, prior to hearing the gospel and getting mm -hmm. the understanding of, of right. marriage, divorce, and marriage according to the, to the of course, law of Christ? I guess you could ask how would they know that they're guilty of any sin uh, prior to hearing the gospel, uh, which condemns sin. Brother Sain, what would you say to uh, this question uh, about whether, number one, how would they know, and number two, do they really have to know that something is spelled out to be wrong, to be guilty of wrongdoing? Well, you started down that paragraph of thought when you were speaking about the idea of how would they know any sin. Mm -hmm. uh, how would technically we look at murder, lying, stealing, any type of uh, immorality or a thing that is a violation of God's law mm -hmm. and until we come to a knowledge of the truth and, and we find that referenced many times of how we learn the truth, we come to a knowledge of the truth, we hear the truth, we can understand the truth. Ephesians uh, 3, 4 remarks about that. We can know the truth that sets us free, John eight thirty two. When we come to an understanding of God the Father and this is His will. And He has the right to say this is right, this is wrong. Whether we knew that prior to the time of coming initially to an understanding of that, mm -hmm. we then must conform our lives to that will. Yes, sir. To be able to have the benefit of ha hearing our Father say, well done, good and faithful servant. At the end of our life here on earth, the mansion is waiting for us. We must conform to that will, including marriage, right. divorce and remarriage, honesty, integrity. Yeah. I mean, every single aspect of it. If we say that we're not amenable to the laws as far as marriage is concerned, we've got to go and paint that brush fully all over the right. entire uh, realm as far as the laws of Christ are concerned. Yes, sir. So, BJ, if, yeah. I, if I could, Absolutely. playing off of what sure. Brother Paul has said, what he said brought a passage to my mind and it's 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 9 and following. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? He says, Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And so he lists a, a different uh, a list of sins. He right. includes fornication. He includes uh, adultery. And then in verse 11, he says to the Corinthians, and such were some of you, right. he says, but you have been washed and sanctified, you're justified in the name of the Lord. What's the point? He says, here's a list of sins, and some of you who are now Christians were guilty of these things before you became Christians. Right. He specifies fornication, and he specifies adultery. Right. And so they were guilty of violating God's law on marriage, thus uh, adultery, prior to becoming Christians. So God's law on marriage applied to them. 
what did they have to do? He said they had repented, they obeyed the gospel, and they were washed and, and justified. And uh, what uh, Brother Paul said specifically that made me think of this is it's not just adultery, but it's all these other sins. Right. The same thing applies. Very Absolutely good. Very true. Good. We have uh, Thomas on the line. We have a lot of good calls coming in tonight. Uh, a list of sins. Thomas, uh, welcome to the broadcast. Can you turn your television down for us for just a moment? And such were some of you. He says, but you have been washed and sanctified. Thomas, are you there? All right, we'll wait. Thomas may show up here in just a second. Um, this uh, subject has obviously evoked a lot of conversation and a lot of thought. Uh, our number is 662-874-5508. We're coming down the final segment of our broadcast tonight. But we are glad that you have been calling and we want you to continue to do that. Remember, we're on the air every Thursday night at this time from 7 to 8 Central Time for GBN Live. And uh, we cover a lot of different Bible subjects and you can call during those programs as well. Thomas, do we have you yet? Uh, yeah. Hi, Thomas. Welcome. What's your thought tonight? What do you? Hey, want? BJ. Thank you for. Yeah, I'm uh, sorry about that. I was still listening to you on uh, the uh, questions you were discussing a while ago about the couple living together uh, because of health problems. Yes, sir. Was that uh, because uh, were they in a, an adulterous marriage prior to that time? If I remember the caller correctly. Um, I don't know. Did the caller specify, gentlemen? Do you remember uh, the I specifics? I thought the scenario, maybe I misunderstood, okay. but I thought the scenario was here are some people who were in an unscriptural marriage but have remained. Um, actually, I think there might have been two described. One of them was um, a couple because she said the woman did not want to obey the gospel because right. she knew she was in an unscriptural marriage. Well, no, that was, that was not the one. It was about the man and woman that were still living together because of health problems. Okay. I, and, might, uh, I might have missed the comment the, was made that if God uh, did not uh, join that marriage together, that God didn't recognize it. Correct. But the problem is, if they were living in an adulterous relationship, God recognized that marriage, but that it was an adulterous marriage. Correct. Is that not right? Yeah. Of course, what I meant by sure, that when I said he doesn't recognize it, I mean, um, he did not recognize it in the sense that he joined them together. He did not recognize it as a valid marriage. He recognized it as an adulterous, sinful marriage. Yeah. Even, okay. that's right. well, Even well, John the Baptist that. said... I understand that right. now, but since you said that... Right. Yeah. right. Yeah. Thank like, you for uh, clarifying that. John the Baptist was... Yeah. Uh, right. Discussing yeah, but, uh, marriage. Absolutely. You know, this may be something that uh, I know we're off of the line now. Uh, Tom, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but we have only one minute left in the broadcast, and we, okay. we simply are unable to uh, to continue right now. We've got to wrap this up, but thank you very much for calling, and uh, perhaps you can call back another time. Thank, thank you, Tom. Appreciate it. Paul, I was just fixing to say, uh, yes. God recognized that Herod was married. There was a marriage there, but it was a wrong marriage, right. and it's not lawful for thee to have that woman. Right. So, in other words, it, it, it's recognized right. that way, but it's not acceptable. And, you right. know, the right. Bible does use the term marriage accommodatively. Jesus tells yeah. the woman at the well, you've had five husbands. Right. The one you have now is not That's yours. Right. Well, yeah. Jesus is not saying they were all scriptural husbands. He's using the term accommodatively. We so appreciate your watching the broadcast tonight. And we do want you to join us again each week here at 7 p.m. for GBN Live. Until then, may God continue to bless you as you study His divine word.